Now, today I um, want to talk about the S word. Now, it's really interesting because last night, Rob said, you gave it away when you said it only had three letters. I said, what were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? Because uh, I said, it only has three letters. And he said, you, you gave your punchline away. I said, it never had four, Rob. It was either going to be sin or sex. <laughs> and it's sin. We're going to talk about sin today. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Now listen, I want to say up front, I am not talking about our eternal salvation. For those of us who've accepted this, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as a person, that God did that for our personal salvation, I'm not talking about where you go when this is all over. I'm talking about how we live with sin in ourselves and each other on a daily basis and how to be gentle in doing that because it's not always easy. Either we're too hard on ourselves or we're too hard on others. And normally it's a combination of both. So if you've got a minute, um, turn with me to Luke's gospel, chapter 18. And we're gonna read verse nine to 14. It's the story of the tax collector or the tax agent and the Pharisee. Now, I've been told that the edition up on the, on the um, screen is slightly different from what I'm going to read, but just stick with, you guys are intelligent, you can do this. All right. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, the Pharisees, Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers. It sounds like my teenagers. Well, mum, you should be thankful. I don't do this, 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 and this. Look at all those awful, naughty people. I'm not like other men, not like robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even, even like this tax collector just here. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Now listen to this. It's important we listen to this because it's in the red and we know what in the red in the Bible means, it means Jesus said it, right? So it says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other one, went home justified before God, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I have a little theory on humility. You either humble yourself or it happens to you, which becomes humiliation. So, this guy, Jesus said, was the better. I mean, it, it blows my mind that he had the audacity to try and point out to God, did you not see that this man is a sinner? Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, and all the good things that I'm doing, and look at him. Like, we're talking now, he is actually saying, God, listen, in case you've missed something, the audacity, and yet we do this quite often ourselves, when we are pointing out that God should hear us because we do this, this, and this, and we're not like this, this, and this. But that's not what Jesus says. You see, the difference between the Pharisee and the tax agent was that the Pharisee was convinced that he held the whole truth and his religion. The tax collector did neither. He recognized his sin and the need for God. Now today, you know, when you preach, it is very different from giving a talk. It is very different from doing a lecture. It's very different from doing a leadership thing. It's different because you go through the ringer. And let me tell you, this week I've been through the ringer, the washing machine, and the dryer. Because what you're dealing with is living and active and spirit. It's not just intellect. This message today 
I don't really care what you think about me. Look, I like it when you like me, I'll be honest. But the point of this message is to shift you. And actually, what I am asking the Lord to do, and I hope you work with me here, because listening in a congregation is not a spectator sport. You are with me on this journey. We are pilgrims. I'm not a performer. We are all pilgrims together. Preaching is not a spectator sport. Sometimes it feels lonely. But I'm asking you to sit in this moment because we will never have this moment again. You will never be the person exactly how you are with the life circumstances around you right now that you will be tomorrow or the next day. So the feeling that I'm asking God to give you today is, oh, oh, when, when do I do that? When do I do, I do that? Oh, that kind of feeling, is it possible? Because the reality is that normally when you recognize things in other people, it's actually a mirror to things that you do yourself. And it might actually be a mirror image, it might be the opposite, but it's equally not as good, okay? So stay with me and allow the Lord. It was fascinating, last night I was talking to people afterwards and somebody was doing something and I said to their husband, so how, how do you feel about that? Would you like to mirror that gently? And the person said, yeah, well, actually, it is a little bit too much. And it was lovely, lovely, because we have to mirror gently, not slam things home to people, because nothing will change if you slam things home, because the people end up retreating. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you that this is a moment in time, a unique moment in time, Lord God, that you know everybody's circumstance and you know where they're at. Lord, you know the things that they're stuck in and can't move on from. Father, those little habits, those little rituals, those little things that we do that we're totally unaware of, but yet they they have an effect on those around us, those that we love, Lord God, and Lord, those that we're trying to lead to you. Father, I pray that you would teach us and show us, Lord, that we would be willing to be transformed so that we can show your love to all those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what actually is sin? Well, the doctrine of sin is central to Christianity, but trying to find a cohesive pattern of what exactly is sin in the scripture is actually not as easy as you may think. You could say to me, well, the Bible clearly says something. Well, right now we've all got a problem because I can't see any woman in here wearing a head covering. And the Bible clearly says in Corinthians that everyone in a, in a congregation like this, every woman must be wearing a head covering. So we have to think that some of the things that we have th thought of as sin, and some of you who are Irish in the, in the congregation today will get this when I go through some of the examples, some of the things that we thought were sin were actually just historical and culturally a, a problem or a challenge at the time. Let's take a little look down memory lane. I've got a picture here of a woman working. Now, not only is this woman working, but she's doing a man's job. I mean, this is scary. Next, I've got superheroes. I remember going through a whole stage in the 80s where superheroes, you just couldn't let your children read about superheroes because Jesus was the only superhero. Uh, I mean, I myself, I'm a superhero. I put on a penny, you know, a, pin, a, a, a apron, and I become invincible. It actually does something to the wiring of my brain. Woman with short hair. Now, my dad's friend, who's recently passed away, he said to me two years ago, Chrissy, I just can't get used to women seeing their ears. You know, just can't, I can't. And, 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 I, and I said, well, what about a ponytail? Oh, well, that's all right, because the hair's still there. <laughs> and makeup. Like, there was a time where makeup, you were seen as ungodly or sinful if you wore makeup. Drinking alcohol. Now, there's nobody in this congregation that would say that getting drunk is a good thing. Nobody. However, there are people, friends of ours, good friends of ours, who actually believe that it is impossible to be a Christian and have a drink of alcohol. Now, we're in serious trouble if that's the case. Watching movies. Movies used to be completely banned. Then it went from watching movies to watching movies on Sunday. I mean, we weren't allowed to shop, read uh, a newspaper on a Sunday, or um, even watch TV. And some of my friends grew up without TVs in their home because a TV was ungodly and sinful. Sports on Sunday, not on. 
Handel's Messiah divided the church in England and Ireland for 10 years. Why? Because they couldn't understand why you would sing the praises of God in a theater. I mean, we have churches and gyms these days. Oh. What about Sunday school? Some people thought that Sunday school was sinful because you were doing something that should be done during the week on the Sabbath. I mean, it's weird. One of the things I was talking to some of the team about, and I've been thinking about this whole conversation about what is sin in 2018. In fact, we had people over for dinner and the topic of what do we think sin comes up, came up as, as it does when you're having a dinner. Um, and I had a little bit of a hypothesis, which I'm going to explain to you shortly. But, you know, 30 years ago, children born out of wedlock, the children were so badly treated. You know, it's not their fault. And thankfully, that has changed. Looking directly in somebody's eyes, like if two businessmen in Bayside looked directly in somebody's eyes and shook hands firmly, it would be completely normal. But in Asian communities, it's the boy is considered respectful. It would be considered rude and unacceptable. In fact, um, some people, I've got this little photograph here, you know, of uh, little people going a little bit too far down and do downward facing dog. Oh, that's a little, yes, that's a little businessman. Can I have my little downward facing dog one? I love this. Now, let me tell you something. The reason that we use pictures, this is just a little side, you know, a little squirrel. I'm doing a little squirrel. The reason we use pictures is that you're actually fluent in another language, and that's images, because what that means to you is completely different than what it means to me. And that's how the Holy Spirit works in our life as well. What God is touching on your life about today is gonna to be completely different to the person beside you. And the point is, don't kick them when it's affecting you. You just listen and allow it to work through you. Swearing. I'll never forget the first time somebody at Bayside, a great person who I disclosed who it was last night, he was sitting there and he laughed, when he said a swear word. I mean, I was brought up to believe a Christian could never use any swear word. That's why I was so astounded that my husband even thought it could be a four-letter word, not a three-letter word. <laughs> but people used to put money in a swear jar. Goodness me, if people put money in a swear, a swear jar, we would end world poverty. <laughs> I'm not saying it's right. In fact, I find it obscene because it is so over the top now. It's almost like another language that you have to speak, even in professional circles. Another thing was people believe that Christians must have it all together because if you don't have it all together, you must be in sin. Guys in particular were brought up to not show emotion. Now listen, I have no issues with guys showing emotion. What I do have an issue with is them taking the chocolate. <laughs> that is not on. Cry if you want, but don't steal the chocolate. That is wrong. Our image of perfection you know, I actually Googled uh, perfect Christian guy, perfect Christian girl, and this is what came up. I thought it wasn't half bad. No, that's the man with the chocolate. He's bad. Oh, there's a lady. I need, I need the Catholic priest. Yes. <laughs> Catholic, I said, image of perfection, and up came the Catholic priest. You know, sometimes we won't let our children go to movies because of bad language. Well, maybe we should keep them home from school. As a child, you know, someone said to me the other day, they used to think that when they recognized sin in somebody else, that was a good thing. Now they realize that that is judgment because some of the things that we used to think was sin, we're now realizing was not necessarily, it was the way we looked at things. I spoke to somebody who was introduced to porn by their father. And when he became a Christian, it was five years until he realized that that was objectifying women and just not acceptable. But because he was introduced to it by his father, he didn't think there was anything wrong with it. You know, kids today talk back all the time. And they call it communication. They call it their human right. They call it freedom of speech. The Bible would say that honor your mother and father so that it may be well with you. Women in ministry, well, we've, we've, we're too late for that now. <laughs> but 
what we all need to consider that our ideas and our worldviews are just that. They're mine or they're yours. And we don't have to put those sort of things onto other people. You know, the funny thing is that there are things that I passionately believe in and I believe also in the opposite. So I passionately believe that people shouldn't kill people. Passionately. It is nobody's right to take the life of another. But I passionately believe that I should offer forgiveness and be a living act of forgiveness to someone that I'm ministering to in a prison who has committed that crime. I believe in both things equally strongly. I believe that drug dealers need to be rehabilitated and I believe that drugs are bad and wrong. And there you go, it's hard to hold both things because as Christians, we often want everything in nice and tidy little boxes and nice and tidy little boxes doesn't actually work. Going back to the story of the tax collector and the Pharisee, I wanna read that to you again. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Because I think that the things that we think overtly are sin. Maybe, but also it's the hidden things, the things that we take as normal. Because inside each one of us, there is this desire to fill an emptiness. St. Augustine says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. You have made us for yourself, O God, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. We try many things to fill our emptiness Technology, that can become idolatry, an addiction. Food, well, like I was saying to you the other day, I, I, I was under extreme stress and I thought, I'll just medicate on a little bit of extra chocolate. <laughs> and you can laugh at that. And you can say, oh, it's not that bad because it only harms you. But we are stupid if we think that what we do to ourselves and how we act does not have an impact on other people. Now, on any given day, a little bit of chocolate is not gonna do you any harm. But if you are using chocolate and inhaling it, like I was, here I am being very vulnerable with you, so that I almost induced a sugar coma, (laughs) because I would rather do that than shout at my kids, there was clearly something else that I needed to do. I needed to go and rest in God. So I came straight home and told Rob, and he said, where's the other part of the, cho- where's the, other part of the chocolate? <laughs> Fear of missing out. You know, we wanna make sure that we know the very latest information. We wanna know what's going on in people's lives. We wanna have, the, you know, we wanna be, we wanna know. We wanna say we have the best relationship. We wanna say, I know that person well. We have, you know, this is a problem, if it's consuming you, if it's out of love and a general heart, but if you panic because you don't know a bit of information, let me tell you something. We are normally the last to know a lot of information about people, and if I was worried about that, I'd be dead. Sometimes we know things because people tell us early, and then they were sworn to secrecy, and then whenever it actually happens, I go, did I know that or did I not? And I just go, oh, that's interesting. It's not important. Often, you know, we, we want to be so up to date with things that we, you know, listen to five different news services and we've got things fed online constantly. It's, it's not going to change your world. I mentioned chocolate to you, but there's this gorgeous image that I was just like, oh, look at this. Where's my chocolate? Oh, 
<laughs> like that says, that talks to me, that image. Life is like a box of chocolates. What about shopping? Some people are restless, so they go shopping. I I've talked to people, listen to this, this is true, people that I know, that I love. I tried it myself because I thought, does that work? And they said, well, sometimes when we really need to shop, what we do is we go online, we put everything in the basket, and then we close the computer, we feel as if we've shopped, and then, and then tomorrow we don't want it. <laughs> I know people who've gone to the shops, bought the things, and then taken it back just to fix that craving. Are you see, because our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. And you know, I, I can laugh at that because that's not me. But they can laugh at me because they've watched me like a woman possessed look in every cupboard to see if there's even any drinking chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> what about our social lives? Have we, imp have we packed them up so much that we don't have time for this rest and solitude. I know people who have every minute of every day scheduled. How are you going to reflect? How are you going to think? How about, how are you going to think, how can I have that conversation differently? How can I change the way I'm thinking, doing, acting, behaving? If you have no time scheduled, literally for thinking, on a bad day, I schedule 10 minutes for thinking. On a good day, I schedule an hour. Every other day, it's probably 30 minutes. You can probably tell which day you get me on when you talk to me. <laughs> it's that obvious. What about latest trends? You know, sometimes I just look at people and go, is that even a thing? They're talking about a trend. I go, is that a thing? Oh yeah, mama, that's a thing. Or, oh yeah, that's a thing. I'm like, is that a thing? Yeah, that's the thing, because it's the latest trend. We make trends out of things, and we want to be part of it, and we want to know what the thing is. What about knowledge? You know, it's good to learn, but if you're just pumping the knowledge in and not actually processing it, not actually thinking, how is this changing my world? Can I use one bite of this? Then you're going to become overwhelmed, and you're still going to be empty. The Bible talks about going to cisterns that will not fill you. This is a thing, the latest sickness. People will have whatever you have or something similar <laughs> because that is socially acceptable. Please do not confuse your Google search with my medical degree because what happens is doctors have to tell you because of liability that you know, you're feeling tired could actually be leukemia. Now, it's likely not, 99.9% .9 is probably not, but then you go down the whole, the whole thing, you try to re research it without any metrics or understanding. It's like somebody going to law and trying to do fireside lawing off the internet or fireside accounting or fireside engineering, don't build my house, please, or fireside theology, fireside whatever, because you don't have the years of pushing through on the study on that. You know what? I hope it's not the case, but even if that was the bad result, then God is enough. He will be enough. He always has been and he always will be. But we spend our time being restless, trying to find out what is wrong. We can even do this with religion. We become so determined to find out what is right and what is wrong that we become what is known as fundamentalist. Now, I haven't got a lot of time, and I'm not going to go into this, but historically, a lot of fundamentalism is based on fear. It's based on, you know, we've got to keep things at bay. We've got to, you know, we've got to not allow things to change. I've heard people say, and I've probably said it myself, well, Christians have believed this for 2,000 years. It's all right for them. It'll be okay for me. And we believe that we have got the only orthodox part of how we believe. And everybody else has got some distorted version. Everybody else. You know, we got to start talking about the elephants in the room because there's herds in the room, not just an elephant. So I talked about talking about animals. 
I talked, oh, I need to tell you something really interesting. This is another squirrel moment. People like my squirrel moments. I know that those of you that are logical, listen, you've got lots of logical preachers. I'm doing a deconstructed message. The new thing in is deconstructed meringue, which is basically a meringue that's fallen apart, or deconstructed roast, which is basically when you can't uh, you know, carve it properly. But on animals, you need to know this. Girls, this is for the girls in the, in the house. Did you know that the killer whale is the only other mammal that has a menopause? And, no, it gets better, it gets better. When it has had the menopause, it ends up leading all the males and females in its community, even the dominant males, clearly something happens in those hormone surges, for about 30 years. That's scary. Anyway, back to animals. Hypothesis. What is my hypothesis on what sin is? We better get to this point because it's different from what you think, but I think you're getting there. I think you're getting the idea. So hypothesis, when I was a little girl, I used to remember, this is how I remember hypothesis. It's like hippopotamus. And hippopotamus is underneath. So it's something that is underlying um, something. And I think that what is underlying our sin of 2018 is addiction. And I've got a video clip to show you a point. All right, uh, Stephen, we haven't heard from you. Let's hear your story. Yeah, uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was hooked the very first time. Uh, it was senior year, I was at a party, and uh, you know my parents wouldn't allow it in the house, so I didn't have as much exposure to it as some of my friends. It was kind of a, a late bloomer, I guess. I had a lot on my mind at the time of graduation, thinking about college coming up, and uh, it was weird because I, I could relax but feel this rush of adrenaline at the same time. I, I had never felt anything like that. You know, uh, I even started thinking about it when I was alone. I was daydreaming about it at school. <laughs> After a while, it wasn't just a weekend thing anymore. I was sneaking over to my friend's house. I mean, my whole senior year was a complete blur. <laughs> um, you know, then I moved to college, and uh, you know, I'm living in the dorm with all of my buddies and no parents around. So you know, that's a nightmare. I, I lasted two semesters. Wow. Anyway, after I quit school, things actually turned around for me. I um, <laughs> I made a vow to myself that I wouldn't touch it, and I didn't for over three years. I got a great job. I met someone. I got married. I was really back on track. But then we started going to church, and I joined a small group. But that's where it happened, of all places. You know, the guys were just hanging out, and and one of them offered, and I accepted. I couldn't resist. It was three years of being clean, just down the drain in two seconds. Anyway, we're uh, going through counseling now, and I still struggle every day with it. And uh, I'm even thinking about it right now. But you know, it's, it's one day at a time, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm getting lagged here, guys. Watch your sixes. Get that, somebody get that sniper. No, 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 I, I'm taking fire. Ah! Now, you see, I wonder what was going through your mind when you were watching that. You were probably thinking, all sorts of different things that it could be, right? Because everyone has different challenges with different things. Addiction, the definition of addiction is the fact or condition of being addicted to a substance or activity. Dependency, craving, habit, weakness, compulsion, fixation, enslavement. You know, people say that people have a slavish addiction to fashion. Clearly, that is not one of my addictions. But my definition of it is this. Anything that negates or mitigates our need for God and tries to shortcut or substitute relationship either with God or others. Anything that negates or mitigates our need for God and tries to shortcut or substitute relationships either with God or others. Like sometimes I've watched kids and, of, and older people try to have a tough conversation with someone, but they do it on text. Now, why do they do it on text? Is it because that's the way of the times? Partly, but partly is because we have an addiction to trying to have this 
image of harmony. We can't tolerate loose ends. We can't tolerate messy. And we can't tolerate being able to be mirrored and to mirror one another gently. We try to fill our lives with anything but God. One of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr, uh, also, and you know, when you think you've got a great thought, which I thought, ah, oh, wow, this is a great thought when we were talking about it at dinner. Then I find that one of my great friends, he's not a friend, I've never met him in my life, but he's a friend in the Lord. He's a fellow pilgrim, Richard Rohr. He had this definition of um, addiction, which I just, I, I read it, reread it, and read it again. I'm gonna read it to you because it is absolutely amazing. All societies are addicted to themselves and create deep codependency on them. There are shared and agreed upon addictions in every culture and every institution. These are often the hardest to heal because they do not look like addictions because we have all agreed to be compulsive about the same things and blind to the same problems. The gospel exposes those lies in every culture. The American addiction to oil, war, and empire. The church's addiction to its own absolute exceptionalism. The poor person's addiction to powerlessness and victimhood. The white person's addiction to superiority. The wealthy person's addiction to entitlement. Christians are usually sincere and well-intentioned people until you get to any real issues of ego, control, power, money, pleasure, and security, then they tend to be pretty much like everybody else. We often give a bogus version of the gospel, some fast food religion, without any deep transformation of the self. And the result has been the spiritual disaster of Christian countries that tend to be as consumer oriented proud, warlike, racist, class conscious, and addictive as everybody else, and even more so, I'm afraid. That's a very sobering, sobering quote. But the first antidote to addiction is actually acknowledgement. Sin, addiction, I'm talking about the same thing. You know, we can sit in church and we can think that we come in here like the Pharisee and we go, well, we're here. Oh, well, God, we're here. Oh, well, go ahead, make my day, he says, you know. We're here. And I'm here every week, not like that person. And, you know, I haven't been nasty this week. Well, you're lucky. And I haven't done this and I haven't done that. And, and we can be like the Pharisee instead of coming in here and going, oh God, you know, I'm, I'm, I, need, I need your help. I need you to point out the things in me that need to be transformed by your love and by the love of my brothers and sisters, my fellow pilgrims. You know, a pilgrim on a road will point out something that you may want to be aware of. And that's what people who love you will do. They'll gently mirror, you know, you know the way you can't stand the way that happens in that situation? Well, there's times where you do that. Oh, okay. The biggest problem we face is a lack of acknowledgement. Richard Rohr also says, you cannot heal what you do not first acknowledge. The Bible says it this way. You can't take the log out of somebody else's you can't take a speck out of somebody else's eye when you've got a log in your own eye. First of all, it's totally impractical. You know, you imagine the size of the speck and the size of the log. Can you imagine that? Like, you know, that makes me laugh. I think that's a really funny image. Can you imagine somebody with a big log sticking out of their eye? They're so far away and they've got a pair of tweezers and they're desperately trying to get the speck out of somebody else's eye. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe it's just me that thinks about those sort of images. I mean, clearly, clearly, it is only me that thinks about that. But when you do think about that, it's ridiculous. So the antidote to sin and addiction is acknowledgement and vulnerability. Another one of my friends, uh, Brene Brown, who I've got a very short clip of, I love, she's, she's a researcher, an academic, and she's done research on vulnerability. And I just wanna show you 30 seconds of her. So I'll start with this. A couple of years ago, an event planner called me because I was going to do a speaking event. And she called and she said, I'm really struggling with how to write about you on the little flyer. And I thought, well, what's the struggle? And she said, 
Well, I saw you speak, and I, 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 I'm going to call you a researcher, I think, but I'm afraid if I call you a researcher, no one will come because they'll think you're boring and irrelevant. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And she said, so, but the thing I liked about your talk is, you know, you're a storyteller, so I think what I'll do is just call you a storyteller. And of course, the academic, insecure part of me was like, you're going to call me a what? And she said, I'm going to call you a storyteller. And I was like, oh, why not Magic Pixie? Um, <laughs> I was like, I, I don't, I, I, let me think about this for a second. And so I tried to call deep on my courage. And I thought, you know, I am a storyteller. I'm a qualitative researcher. I collect stories. That's what I do. And maybe stories are just data with a soul, you know, and maybe I'm just a storyteller. So I said, you know what? Why don't you just say I'm a researcher storyteller? And she went, <laughs> there's no such thing. <laughs> so I'm a researcher storyteller. Do yourself a favor and, and look her up because the antidote to acknowledgement of the things that we do that, are, that need to be transformed are our vulnerability. For me, that's doing the prayer of examine. For me, that's sitting down and reflecting each day. It's creating a space that I can say, hey, listen, I'm not doing too good with this. Can you help me out on this? And coming to people that will go, you know what, you're not bad, but I can see what you mean, and, and let's, let's work on this together. We need to create an environment here at Bayside where we are and the church in general, where we're not the Pharisees, where we become more the tax collectors, where we recognize our own sin, where when somebody comes up to us and goes, you know, I am really struggling, you know, I've, I've, I've wore myself too thin this week, I haven't planned my diary right, and you can turn around to the person and you go, you know, me too, me too, I've, I've made a couple of those mistakes. Because like I said, and if you can't find it on Google, it mustn't exist, there is not the perfect Christian there's not even the perfect Catholic Christian priest or Catholic Christian man or woman. Doesn't exist. Sandra spoke on community a couple of weeks ago and the importance of connection. We're neurobiologically wired for connection. But what keeps us away from this vulnerability, the thing that will transform us, is our shame. And shame causes us to disconnect. It causes us to fear disconnection. And shame is a thing that underpins the idea in our head that we're just not enough. We have to live this life on the surface that is quite different from the life that we really live. Shame is a focus on self, whereas guilt is a focus on our behavior. Shame is different for men and women, but it feels the same. For a man, it's that shame of weakness. For a woman, it's I've got to be able to do everything, be everything, and not sweat in the process always look the right way. Shame causes us to not to want to fail. And the challenge that we are faced is that shame is actually an epidemic in today's society. We have got to get out from under it because it's only when we get out from under it that we find our way back from it. We need to find our way back from secrecy, silence, and judgment. The most powerful words that we can say to another person is, you know, I experienced that too. I was thinking the other day, I was feeling a little bit physically tired and I'm thinking to myself, I'm trying to find all the solutions. And a girlfriend came up to me today and she said, because I'm thinking, well, she's not tired. She's, she's, she's doing her exercise. She's eating properly. That's probably why. Then I just need to add exercise. You know, we try to fix things. We try to put things in. And then she said to me, you know, I'm, I'm tired too. And I go, you know what? That's such a relief. That's such a relief to know. Sometimes it's good to know that other people experience the same thing. You know, Brene talks about, she's done six years research on this whole area. And she says the difference between people who feel shame and people who don't feel shame. Now, this is in a, in a nutshell, her research, so please forgive me. Um, is, it, is the difference between people who feel worthy, who, a sense of worthiness, and people who don't feel a sense of worthiness to connect. And the only reason why people feel worthy and the others don't feel worthy is that they believe that they are worthy. Now listen, we are worthy because of who we are in Christ. 
We are enough. This thing that keeps us out of, the, the, out of connection is often our, fame, our, our fear of the worthiness of it. We're worthy because we're part of the human race. We're all different, but we've all got a sameness. God has redeemed us at the huge cost of his son, Jesus. We need to take courage. I love the word courage. It means with your heart. We need to learn to live with our heart. Yes, we need to learn to live with the things that we understand, but we've got to push them down from our head and through our heart. And sometimes we have to do it the other way around. But we have to learn to live with our whole selves. You know, it's like the hokey pokey. You know, you put your whole self in and your whole self out. You know, you can't, you can't live a half-hearted life if you want to live a life in community that is real, that is transformative. And sin stops us from living a transformative life because it keeps us in shame and guilt. And that's because of our addictions to trying to be who we are, who we think we should be, sorry. Instead of let, letting go of who we think we should be in order to be who we really are. That really is what sin comes down to. Learning to embrace vulnerability, learning to be straight up like this tax collector is one of the things that will radically change our lives and the lives of those around us. I say to you as I say to God, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Father, forgive me for the things I know I do and for the things I don't know that I do. And Lord, give me the people around that will gently mirror some of the things that I do that can make your place and my place a better world for us to live, to make Bayside a better church for us to live in and connect in and communicate in, for us to stop that compulsive desire to judge. When we hear somebody's story, we go, oh, wow. And then quickly, it's so easy to go, well, thank God I'm, I'm not there. You know, we need to learn to stop that. We need to get a grip and recognize that just as we're about to say, we're not there. We might not be there, but we may be somebody else. We may be somewhere else in God's eyes. And that's why Jesus said, you know, here's a Pharisee thinking he's recognizing where he is, but he's totally, totally blinded to where he is not. And Jesus says, that is actually the better way. You know, you need to, I need to, we need to grab hold of ourselves and go, there but for the grace of God, go I. Let me invite you into that place. Let me invite you to keep this place open where you can have conversations and be open and vulnerable, not to everybody, but to people that you trust who will gently mirror and help you on this road. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you.